Hi, and welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, this, of course, is our Q&A session. Get your questions in in the comments underneath. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Joining me this week is Finn from Full Factory Suspension, and he's going to be answering all of your questions. Now, if you haven't seen the video where we had a little bit of a tour around Finn's workshop, you've got to check it out. It's absolutely ridiculous. That is in the comments underneath, well, in the little section underneath this video. So please do check that one out and hit us up any more questions after this video using that hashtag AskGMBNTech. Okay, so first two questions are kind of together here, Finn. They're both on compression damping. Yep. Uh, so the first one says, can you explain for a beginner how the compression setting works? I find it hard to understand it and how to set it up. And the other question basically asks that, but also with with rebound adjustment as well. Okay, um, well, first off, for the compression side of things, uh, you have high speed compression and low speed compression. Uh, low speed compression would be something slow to, to react on the bike. So something like your body weight moving on the bike, that's low speed. So, um, for instance, if you wanted your bike to pedal really well, um, you didn't want it to bob around when you're sprinting, whack on a load of low speed. By on, I mean clockwise on the dial, so to the plus. Or with the rock shocks, you have the, the turtle and the hair yeah. symbols. Um, yeah, so wind that on. The low speed will slow down the bobbing effect due to your pedaling motion. Yeah, basically, but basically your, your weight, isn't it? Yes. On, on the yeah. bike, yeah. Yeah, essentially. Uh, and then high speed. And the high speed is, as it's described, really anything coming up quickly. So a big drop, if you're blasting along the trail and you hit a big rock, that's your high speed reaction. Um, a big mistake people make with that is they dial in the high speed because they're trying to make the bike firmer. But actually what they want to do is increase the pressure or increase the spring rate first, get that dialed in, then the then they can fine tune the high speed compression. The high speed compression is really, really only a fine, fine tune. Great stuff, okay. Um, next question actually is based on the video from last week. Yeah. Uh, it's from James Alexander. Yeah. Brilliant video, really enjoyable hearing guys talking shop who are experts in their field. Love your bike shed too, could lose hours in there. Uh, my question is in regards to a fifth element coil shock I have on a 2002 to 2005 Santa Cruz Heckler I bought yesterday. It's my first dual suspension bike, finally getting back into biking after 12 years. Well, that's, that's always great. Um, and the element has been previously tuned at TF Tuned. Yep. As a complete but wanting to learn, um, how the hell do I set this thing up? Are there any quick settings I can do, or do I need specific tools? I think we'd better tell people about the fifth element first, what, yeah. it, what, it, what it actually is. <laughs> the fifth element shock was pretty advanced for its time. Uh, it involved, the basic principle is, they had a preloaded piston in there, um, which would pop open and closed as you used the shock. So on a low speed hit, it would stay shut, meaning the shock had a really nice platform to it. Um, on a high speed hit, it blows open, uh, allowing the oil to flow and allowing the suspension to move through the travel. So these shocks, when they were around in sort of the early 2000s, a lot of suspension bikes suddenly started having a lot of suspension travel, but it didn't necessarily pedal very well. So that valve that Finn's talking about was actually the key to a lot of poor bikes performing really well. Um, not to suggest that your bike is a poor bike, it was just a bike that made good advantage of that. But how, how on earth do you set them up? I've, I've never actually spent much time with one. Yeah, it worked, they work really well with a single pivot bike, um, just because the dynamics worked pretty good. Um, with those shocks, obviously, you've got four elements, essentially. You've got your high speed, your low speed compression. You've got your rebound, which is only low speed. Um, it doesn't have a high speed separation for your rebound. I mean, Any reason why? Uh, the high speed's handled internally through the shim okay. stack. Um, we can go into that a little bit more in, later on, if you like, and go into detail. Yeah, sure. Um, but essentially, yeah, you've got your high speed compression, low speed compression, your rebound, and then also with the progressive fifth element shocks, you can adjust the pressure in the piggyback chamber, which what that does is it changes the point at which that valve blows open. So you can firm it right up, or you can run it really soft. 
Yeah, so these valves, you might have heard of them as uh, named like stable platform valves, things like that. You might have seen them in the motor world, like in particular on those massive off-road racing trucks. You think how much suspension they have, when they go around corners, they use similar sorts of valves, don't they, to stop them basically tipping over. Yeah. I kind of think there's a miniaturized version exactly of Exactly the same principle. So you've got a stable platform for your low speed, and then when your high speed hits come up, it blows open and allows the bike to travel. So, um, how the hell does James set it up then? <laughs> okay, um, those two little blue adjusters on the top, be really, really careful with them. They're really fine and they're tiny, and the first thing that you'll do is you'll wrench on them and they'll snap off. Ooh. And you'll never get any parts for it <laughs> ever again. So be really gentle with those. Um, in an ideal world, we used to do like a little plastic Allen key for them, so actually the Allen key would damage before the shock got damaged. Um, yeah, they were really cool. Um, for the compression on that fifth element, um, you want a little bit of low speed on there, so you want it to pedal pretty good. Although, depending on what's inside, it's difficult to tell with the shock without looking inside it, because a lot of those shocks TF Tuned used to do some sneaky business with, and they used to take the stable platform out and put a shim stack in there and basically turn it into vanilla RC. Interesting. So, but as a rough guide, um, so in your low-speed compression, you want to back it all the way out to the nice gentle stop, don't hang on it, and then turn it two full turns clockwise, and that'll get you a reasonable low-speed compression. Um, it'll make it pretty platformy. Um, it'll pedal really nicely on that single pivot bike, and it won't bob. Um, it just depends what you want out of the bike, is, and it's probably good to spend some time talking to someone who knows a lot about that shock and and what you want from the bike, but you won't know until you spend time on the bike. Okay, next question is, um, is a progressive setup, i.e. smooth at the beginning um, and firm at the bottom, the way to go for most riders, weekend riders like myself and athletes, or is there a standard setup that can allow you to progress gradually as a rider? So I guess um, kind of referring to progressive versus a more linear yep. setup and who, who that's better for. Yep. Um... Yeah, obviously, I, I think you, you want a fair amount of progression in your shot because you don't want it to run to the bottom of the travel quickly and then bottom out because what will happen is it will bottom out harshly. So I would say, yeah, a progressive setup would be my preferred choice. Joe, I'm going to chuck in a question here that kind of stems straight off that. So we talk about air volume spaces quite a lot and yeah. although I know where I am with it, how, how would you suggest someone would approach sort of getting a good feeling yeah. with them? Because you could put, depending on what fork you're running, anything up to about six in some models of forks. Yeah, and again, that's very much dependent on the bike and the rider. Um, but for me, as a, a rough guide would be, put all the volume spaces in first. Start with that, set your sag at your 35% or your 25%, or whatever you want to do. I normally aim for about 28% because um, I like the bottom bracket to be a little bit higher just to clear the rocks. Um, yeah, so I'd say put all the volume spaces in, then set your sag. And then you can, when you're riding, then you can see if you're making full travel. It's, I think, a bit daft in a way to go with none and set your sag, because you'll just be hitting the end of the travel every time. And you won't realise when it's getting to the point where you're kind of oh, I need more or less spaces, because every time it will run to the end of the travel. And yeah, then you've got no indication. But if you start with the most volume spaces, you can set your point, sag point, and then if you're not making travel, just take a spacer out. That's, that's quite good. I've never thought about doing it that way around. I do it backwards. <laughs> so, no, that makes perfect sense, actually. So depending on what model of fork you have, if it's a Fox or a RockShox, they have charts telling you, depending on what wheel size you have and how much travel your fork has, there'll be a limit on how many of those you can put in. So definitely check that with the manufacturer if you're going to experiment with them. And you're, um, sorry. No, no one. And you'll tend to find that a heavier rider will need a lot more volume spaces. For sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, next question, Finn, is from Brandon Williams, who says, Hi, Finn, you mentioned you have your rebound slower and how it's ultimately better, but how do you realise when you have it too slow, and have you got any tips on finding that sort of sweet spot? Yeah, the tip based on the rebound um, was largely, if you're a complete novice, um, faster riders tend to have their rebound pretty fast, but you can come unstuck if you're new to riding, if you have your rebound too fast, because it'll buck you over the bars or ping you off the bike, 
or you find you've not got that front and rear wheel control. Um, I tend to say when you're starting out, a little bit slower is better than a little bit faster. Um, if you find your rebound's too slow, it'll do a couple of things. Um, if it's the rear of the bike, um, the bike will pack, which means, well, the shock will pack down, which means the shock's not being able to recover that stroke for every repeated hit. So you're going in a trail, you got hit, 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 and what's happening is the shock is slowly shortening and shortening and shortening and not extending back into the holes. Um, that manifests on the bike as a harshness in the suspension. And also you may feel like your bars are rotating in your stem. You may feel like uh, you'll yeah. be going along and you'll be going real quick. You'd have to go pretty quick to do this. And, and it'll feel like your bars are coming loose. So you'll be like that. Or likewise, if it was the front, it would feel like... So it's the back we're... sticking down. Yeah, so the back of the bike's coming down. Or likewise, if it was the front, the front packing down, again, that harshness, and it feels like your bars are rotating in your stem. It's quite an odd sensation when you get it. And when I first had that on sensation 20 years ago, maybe, when I was quick, uh, not anymore. Um, it was in the Alps and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I had to have a chat to Tim Flux about it and say, what's going on from bike? And he told me exactly what was going on. Yeah, so there's something else that's really important with, with setting up your damping is it's directly relevant to your spring rate as well. I've seen people before, before comparing like how many clicks of rebound they've got, but they've been totally different weight riders. Like Jack the cameraman, you would run a lot less than I would run, arguably. Um, Very much. Yeah, so. see, people, <laughs> see people making that mistake quite a lot. So um, dial in for yourself, not for what your friends are doing. Okay, next one. This is, this is interesting, and I actually have no idea about this. How does cold or temperature in general impact on suspension performance? Quite a bit, actually. You'd be surprised. Um, the temperature variances we have in the UK aren't that great. Um, although recently we have had a spate of some minus ones, some minus fives. The chaps up in the north would probably know more about that. Um, if you leave your bike in a stone cold shed overnight, your bike will be at zero degrees when you dig it out. Your rebound is gonna be really slow. Your compression's gonna be slow. The forks are gonna feel sticky. Um, I had that situation recently, again. Um, the lure lubricants I use are quite thick. They're around a 20 weight, 15 or 20 yeah. weight. Um, took my bike out on a good Sunday thrash. We did 30, 40 miles. Um, and my fork was just feeling really harsh. So I thought, oh, I'll just do a lower lube change. And inside the, um, the lower lubricant had actually solidified and it was like margarine. Yeah. It was ridiculous how gloopy it was. Um, so for the winter, certainly change out your lower lube at the very least. Yeah. Um, get a lighter lubricant in the five weights, really nice for that. Um, so am I right thinking your the sort of the oil that's inside the damper should technically get warm as it's cycling through the damper? It will to so. some extent, but it doesn't always. Um, I tend to run one or two clicks less compression and less rebound in the winter yeah. anyway. Um, but yeah, you're, you're, you've got to be then aware that your bike will warm up. Uh, well, it could. <laughs> I think there's, there's something I, I want to do for the channel for next winter is travel somewhere and spend a couple of weeks just doing a load of content yeah. on Sub-Zero. Yeah. Because we, we so seldomly get that sort of weather conditions here in the UK, and I think actually it'd be really interesting to do that. And we get a really good trip as well. We go somewhere cool. Do you want to come? Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Um, well, that, that's pretty much it for um, for this week's show. We're going to carry on because there's a load more questions that we've not got through with Finn, and uh, we'll see you on next week's show. Uh, don't forget, if you've got any questions you want to ask Finn, get involved in those comments underneath. Use the hashtag AskGMBNTech, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>